הדובר הבא שלנו ישראל גדל בישראל, אבל נסע להרבה מאוד שנים בחו"ל וחזר אלינו בשעה טובה לפני תקופה קצרה. ישראל הוא בוגר NYU והרווארד ביזנס סקול. הוא התחיל את הדרך שלו בבנקאות להשקעות בגולדמן זאקס, ומשם בעצם צמח בציר הפיננסי בכל חברות האי-קומרס הגדולות, פייפל, אמזון ואי-ביי. הקים מיזם שנקרא גזל, שעליו הוא ידבר היום, והיום הוא מנהל את מאס צ'לנג' שזה בעצם המאיץ הידידותי ביותר שפותח עכשיו סניף בישראל. אז ישראל גנות, בבקשה. תודה רבה, אהוד. תודה רבה, אלי. ערב טוב לכולם. כמו שאלי אמר מקודם, אני אציג את הדברים באנגלית, בגלל שחוויתי אותם באנגלית בבוסטון, אבל אשמח לקחת שאלות אחר כך גם בעברית. So let me start with a question. Uh, how many of you upgrade your smartphones every time a new phone comes out? Well, you can, every couple of years. Okay, you, can, you, can, you can admit it. We all, we all do that. So with that question, that question formed the foundation for the foundation of Gazelle when we started the company in 2006, 2007. The idea was very simple. We all buy phones, we all upgrade, and the question was, what do you do with the old phone, with the old laptop, with the old uh, uh, iPad, when you upgrade to a new device? And the idea was very simple. Let's create a service that uh, gives consumers a reward, actually pay consumers for, uh, in a very fast, easy, simple way, uh, for the old technology when they upgrade to the new technology. The idea was very simple, and it worked like a charm for five or six years. We grew the company, we doubled the size every single year, 2013, we got to a point where we were forecasting to be over $100 million in revenue, we raised a lot of money from VCs, I hired a great team, built a great uh, processing center, things were working. And then in September 2013, something amazing happened. Apple, to the surprise of everybody, announced yet one more new phone. It was the iPhone 5S that was about to uh, uh, come to the market in late uh, September, and that was our Christmas, our bonanza. A new iPhone comes out, we knew we were going to get lots of new iPhones and uh, resell them in the secondary market. <clears throat> we had an ad campaign, we started to advertise on TV, we spent $20 million on TV campaigns that year. This was my favorite ad campaign, which we don't have that time to watch. We're spending money on TV. We had buyers lined up, mostly in Hong Kong. This business is beautiful. We actually had buyers that uh, committed to a price and wrote us checks for tens of millions of dollars uh, in uh, Q4 of 2013, all lined up to buy those fives and the forests and the fours that we knew we were going to get. We felt so good about it. Actually, we created this t-shirt to celebrate it five years at Gazelle. One of my advisors at Gazelle asked me a very simple question. He asked me, I'm sure you got the question before, what keeps you up at night? at night. And you know, you know what my answer was? Which I'm never going to answer that way. I said, I don't know. Not much. Things are going really well. And then the day after happened. <laughs> then came October 2013. So what happened? I landed in Hong Kong, October 6, 2013. Again, with all the success behind us. And I am greeted at the airport with very unhappy buyers. And they're telling me that something is wrong. All the iPhones that we already started to ship to them, think about hundreds of thousands of iPhones sitting in their warehouses, were bricks. They couldn't sell them. They were stuck with those iPhones. And those are customers that paid us tens of, thousands, tens of millions of dollars ahead of time. So that was the beginning of the trip. And the question was, why? What happened? Well, what turns out what happened is AT&T took a decision behind the scenes and decided no mass. So all those years of, uh, of selling uh, locked iPhones in the market, then having them easily unlocked uh, in the secondary market so they can be repurposed and resold, no more. They're not going to let it happen anymore. They shut down the systems, and our buyers were stuck with lots of inventory of iPhones that they could not sell. That's when you say, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so then I come back to the U.S., and basically we were in survival mode. So the first, first war was for fairness. I call it the battle for fairness. I just said, it's not fair. You know, our consumers, our consumers that own these phones, they, uh, they're out of contract with AT&T. You can't expect them to not unlock their phones. There were, um, there were news clips out there, articles written that we also supported about how unlocking is a crime, was considered a crime in the US. That's just ridiculous. 
I will travel down to DC. I met with the chairman of the FCC and educate them that listen, dear guys, this is a big problem. You can't you can't have consumers be in a position where they cannot unlock their phones. This is their property. When you buy a car, and you want to resell your car. Does Toyota lock your car? No. This is just really ridiculous. I wrote to this guy, the AT&T CEO, and I said, that's not fair. What you're doing is taking away $250 million out of consumer pockets just by doing that. I then I went to this guy, because I found that this guy doesn't like this guy. This guy was the CEO of T-Mobile. It turns out that the whole thing with AT&T was because T-Mobile was going aggressively after AT&T, and having unlocked phones in the market was just not a good thing uh, for T-Mobile. So I went to this guy, and this guy said, um, um, no, wait in line, or whatever he said back then. So the first, the first uh, line of defense was playing defensive and trying to, um, to uh, get these guys to work with us. The answer at the end of the day was, uh, we could not compete, not with AT&T, not with anybody else on the number of lawyers and the number of lobbies that they have on Wall uh, on, uh, on, in Washington, so that did not work. So the next battle was the battle for the consumer. Then you know what he said? We're going to go after the consumer, and we're going to educate the consumer. We're going to get the consumer to unlock their phones before they send them to us. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, well, you're just talking about the people are busy with their lives. Who in their mind would actually go through the process of unlocking their phones before sending them to a uh, gazelle? Uh, but we managed to get it right. And we went from about 5% unlocked phones uh, when this thing uh, hit the, the market to 80%, somehow 80%, and which was really a testament for our consumer experience and how we uh, educated the consumer to, um, to unlock their phones. So that helped. And the second thing that we did, we changed strategy. We pivoted the business, mostly from going from the buy side of the business to the sell side of the business. We started sell selling AT&T locked phones in the US, and guess what? AT&T could, could not really get in the way of doing that. Uh, we started selling certified pre-owned uh, products at Gazelle. So what are the key learnings? I don't know. One minute. So one is, uh, one thing I'll admit is that we were so myopic at Gazelle, and we were so focused on getting our business better, market better, operate better, hire great teams, all great stuff. We forgot to look outside uh, of uh, the company and notice that the competition was going to come to the market at some point and essentially eat our lunch. Number two, we were maniacal about the customer experience on the buy side of the business. We knew how to get consumers uh, to convert from basically inertia to actually sending us their phones. We were really good at that. What obviously we did not understand at all was how the sales side of the business worked. We we, it was so easy to sell these phones, and like I said, buyers were lined up. We did not even try to understand this whole thing about unlocking and this and that. That just uh, that was not something that we looked into, and we paid the price for it. But on the upside, is something I believe in is that at the end of the day, if you hire a great team, and if you really invest in the culture, and uh, I don't know if it's written on the shirt here, but the number one value was delivering a crazy awesome experience to our customers, the team will figure it out. There are ways out. Um, and the team will figure out how to uh, be creative, solve the big problems, and get through the tough times. But the best news of all, all that, that brought me back to Israel. Uh, and I'm here today, um, I, as uh, Ellie mentioned before, we're opening the Mass Challenge uh, program here in Israel this year. The question deadline is next week, uh, March 31st. Love to work with all of you. Shireen is here for Mass Challenge. If you have any questions about how to sign up, we'd love to see you all, uh, if you're startups. And with that, I'm going to wrap up.